firstly, can everyone hear me? Yes? Great. Um, thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me to give this talk today. It, um, it prompted me to think about what actually is a powerful artefact. And um, for those of you who um, are familiar with some of my other research, I'm always very interested in how and why people are breaking objects. Um, and when I uh, when this topic came up, I flicked through my PhD and realised that I, I occasionally mention the word power in association with this without ever clearly defining exactly what that means or how that, what that meant to the societies doing it. Um, and indeed, when we look through the, uh, the literature surrounding powerful objects in prehistory, there's very little that directly associates the two, the, the artefacts and the concept of power. Uh, we see perhaps the most famous example in the, the Symbols of Power exhibition from the 80s, but um, also this exhibition from Denmark on gold, power and belief. Of course, all of these are very interested in the pristine, complete, pretty objects that are very obviously powerful things. Um, and, in, and yet throughout um, ethnographic sources, historio, um, historical sources, we see repeated instances of destruction of artefacts for conveying and controlling social power. So you may be expecting me to talk about Malangan art or iconoclasm or, um, um, or, or any of those sorts of iconic ideas around destruction of artefacts. My wife had a better idea. I should go with the most powerful artefact in popular culture, the ring of power. <laughs> <laughs> So I am now going to make a very tentative analogy between the ring of power and prehistoric artefacts. Let's get the worst bit out of the way, the magic. Um, we obviously, um, sorry, yes, for anyone who's not familiar, it's, it's from Lord of the Rings. Um, it is the most powerful object in Middle Earth, partly on account of the fact that it is um, magic, magical. It uh, can turn people invisible. It can bend the will of others around you. Of course, I'm fully aware magic does not exist as much as I would like it to. But uh, we see throughout time that the perception of magic, superstition, supernatural properties are repeatedly conveyed upon objects. So people are very willing to believe that certain objects have magical properties. Um, and this is something we see throughout time, throughout space, in many different cultures around the world, um, even in today's society. One of the Things, one, one of the key things that makes this object powerful within the law of Lord of the Rings is, is how it's used, who uses it, its production method. Um, I delved into my nerdy side and discovered that the Dark Lord Sauron was the one who produced this ring, having accrued the knowledge from working with the elves. Um, and it is, it is part of having the knowledge of how to produce this thing that makes its user powerful and its producer a powerful person. And for this reason, it becomes a very coveted item. It's the fact of what people perceive it can do and the fact that they know who it's been associated with and also the history it's been associated with. It was used to dominate Middle Earth. Um, but most importantly for my talk and for uh, relevance to this paper is that it has to be destroyed in a very particular way. The, the only way to destroy this ring is to take it back to the fires of Mount Doom where it was forged and throw it back in. That is the only way to destroy this object. But it highlights a particular uh, a point that there are social perceptions around the way that objects need to be decommissioned and destroyed. So I'm going to go back to the archaeology now and uh, run you through some powerful artifacts from uh, from the Bronze Age, particularly metal objects, and just kind of go through a series of, of case studies that bring to light <laughs> what the destruction of these objects meant in a Bronze Age sphere. Shields um, are a particularly important object in, in the Bronze Age. They have a relatively limited circulation. They show very high levels of craftsmanship. Uh, this on the right is a metal shield. It has somewhere in the region of 6,000 plus individual bosses hammered into it. The entire thing is hammered from a single sheet of bronze. In some cases, it is 
less than a millimeter thin. These are incredibly difficult objects to produce. You see them produced also um, in wood and in leather, but the metal ones really required quite a high level, um, quite a high level of craft personship. <coughs> and part of this seems to be um, reflected in the way that they were deposited. The shield on the right there um, is from the site of Beeth in South Asia. It was one of five or six. Unfortunately, that's the only one that survives, but the account of discovery is that the five or six was set upright in a bog in a circle. Um, and the, there was clearly a very specific way that these things needed to be deposited. Whether you consider deposition a form of destruction uh, depends on your theoretical outlook. But what I want to present here is one case study in particular, which is the South Cadbury shield from South Somerset. It is the only shield found in the Southwest Peninsula, making it an incredibly rare object. The metal composition suggests that it was produced at the time that metal shields were in general production around, the, around 1400, 1300 BC. However, this one was deposited in a direct connection with a deer bone that produced a radiocarbon date some 200 years later, suggesting that this may have been an object much like the Viking brooches that <coughs> uh, we've just heard about, um, that may have been in circulation within society for a long period of time, potentially as an heirloom. When it came to being deposited, it was stabbed through three times, very deliberately, in situ, um, in, a, in a ditch of an enclosure. So a very um, open arena, something that people could have seen. And if this object had indeed been in circulation for a length of time, the shortest amount of time it could have been in circulation is about 50 years. So we're still talking about a couple of generations at the bare minimum. It would have been an object that people wouldn't have necessarily um, seen before in their area, but they would have known that it existed and it might have con conveyed certain connections linked to that uh, social arena. So the destruction of it would have been linked, um, would have been a very powerful action and something that would have been a mnemonic event that people would have remembered. Even, and in that process, you create both a forgetting of the object, but also the creation of a new memory in remembering the event of depositing it. Um, I'm going to swiftly move on to perhaps what we all think of when we think of powerful objects in prehistory, the shiny gold things. So the, the mold cape and the, the lineally, um, the things that are the conventional symbols of power that uh, from its very earliest use, gold becomes that object of expression. It's made to, be, to ornament the body. It adorns graves and in huge manners of, uh, huge manners of forms. And it has the ability to make the connections with, with uh, solar symbology and also is very rare, very valuable. Not everyone would have um, had access to it. Not everyone would have known how to make it. It can only be extracted from uh, very select parts of certain areas. You need to know what you're looking for. And in this sense, it may have been seen as a magical material. There we go. We link it back. Um, <laughs> However, we also see uh, acts conducted on gold objects that are not in keeping with the idea of it being a valuable material. Here uh, I, we have the Pretty Hoard from Somerset, which is about 19 bracelets and torques uh, produced during the Middle Bronze Age. But upon discovery, uh, they were found crushed into a ball in the ground, entangled in such a way that the finder felt compelled to disentangle them without taking a photograph of it first. Mm -hmm. But if these objects are, are meant to be this expression of wealth and, um, and value and power, what does it mean when you take these out of circulation and when you crush them into a ball? Um, and to give you some idea of what they would have looked like, there is actually a picture of another example of this from Wales. Uh, the picture at the bottom is what it looked like when it came out of the ground. Three ribbon torques that were entangled together in this crushed ball. And the conservators at the time felt that they needed to restore it back to what they should have looked like. Um, this was in the 1950s. But 
clearly there is a, these are the only two examples that I know of from Britain, but we see gold objects decommissioned in lots of different ways, manipulated in lots of different ways, tangled together, uh, crushed together, looped around each other. There seems to be some general idea that when you bury gold objects, it's about entangling them in some way. And we can speculate about whether this relates to who owned the different objects and why, what that meant for um, ideas around entanglement. I'm not going to, to delve into that because I think it's totally unprovable. Um, what I think is particularly interesting is that there is this common perception, particularly during the Middle Bronze Age, but we see it throughout the Bronze Age as well, that decommissioning these objects was an important aspect. A slightly less conventional powerful object is, is the axe. I say these are slightly less conventional powerful objects because despite the fact that we are very acutely aware of how fundamental they were to society, the longevity of their history, the um, fact that the very earliest tools are axes um, made in stone, and this continues throughout time, it's very rare that anyone considers an axe an important, powerful object unless it's very big or very nicely decorated or has something very pristine about it. And yet we, we know that these things were fundamental to living. These were the objects that were part of everyday life and objects that you engage with on a daily basis become powerful purely by their association with their owners, by the way that they're used, by the activities that they're used in. Um, and I've highlighted Scottish axes here because we have lots and lots of early Bronze Age socketed axes, uh, sorry, flat axes in Scotland. And they are buried in all sorts of situations, but predominantly on hilltops or in specific landscape contexts that are set away from areas of agriculture, settlement activities. And we see a combination of practices on them. They are often used, they often seem to have specific histories attached to them, or we can speculate that they have specific histories attached to them. Sometimes we have axes that all seem to have produced, been produced from the same model, but then they've got very divergent use lives, clearly. And on top of this, we see combinations of practices where they are uh, left complete and deposited complete, but also snapped in half. And this is something that's very particular of the Scottish um, Scottish Early Bronze Age societies, is, but these are snapped in half over the thickest part of the axe. This is not an easy thing to do. There are, it requires a certain amount of knowledge and skill and access to resources in understanding how this was done. The easiest way to do this would be to heat the objects to a very high temperature, at which point the material properties of bronze changes and the whole thing just will snap um, on account of being brittle. However, I make it sound very easy when I say it like that, but we do have instances where clearly they, they weren't able to do it. And this poor axe has been bludgeoned. Um, and I suspect that what's happened here is that someone didn't understand that you needed to heat the axe first and they've just hammered it to hell and trying to do it. Um, so we can speculate that there might have been a skill in destroying objects. And from there, we can move from the idea of objects in themselves being powerful to the power of the person doing the destruction, the person who is involved in undertaking these very performative, very knowledgeable processes. Finally, we're gonna to come to weapons. This is, um, this is a replica from my PhD and uh, it gives you some indication of how nice and shiny bronze is when it's not been in the ground for 3000 years. Um, and incidentally, uh, it's some of the inspiration for Tolkien's weapons in Lord of the Rings. But we know that weapons are very powerful, are generally considered very powerful objects. Uh, we know that the symbol of the sword is something that pervades throughout time. You can think very quickly of any number of examples, uh, Excalibur, the destruction of swords in Viking and, early, uh, and Iron Age graves, particularly in Scandinavia and Northern Europe. And it, this seems to be a practice that begins in the Bronze Age. Swords are the first weapons that come in with the, or the first object in time that comes in with the sole intention of just killing someone else. Before this period, you had axes, you had spears, but these were also woodworking tools. These were also hunting implements. 
a sword is pretty much good for nothing other than stabbing someone else. And the, and you see developments in spears that similarly start to convey this, this shift towards a more conflict-orientated uh, production of objects. Whether, in fact, they were used for that is another matter, but they are they are very symbolic, symbolically powerful items. And by the late Bronze Age, we see them wrapped up in uh, what I've termed here destruction events, where people seem to, people across Britain, and it, uh, it's, very, it's a very particularly late Bronze Age British phenomenon, where they gather weapons and deliberately decommission them in some way, uh, uh, usually through what seems to be the piling of weapons on a pyre and just setting fire to the whole lot. But you can see from some of the spearheads on the left-hand side, they've been hacked up a bit. Someone's clearly taken a chisel to some of them. The horde on the right from Duddingston Lock has swords that have been bent in half prior to being burnt. There's any number of examples that I can draw on from across the UK. And some of the theories around this is that it's the, decom it's the uh, decommissioning of powerful objects upon the death of a person. These might be instances of war booty. And we can draw on, draw on uh, Roman sources where we have instances of Romans sacrificing the loot of their enemies so that it can't, can't be used in the afterlife. Whether or not it's right to project that back onto the Bronze Age is, a, is up for debate. But it can't be denied that in collecting this amount of material together and destroying it in such a very obvious way, way you are creating either a mnemonic event or you are uh, whilst also removing the power of these conventionally powerful objects. So the main thrust of this talk has been about <laughs> destruction as an expression of power. Um, I've kind of touched on some of the tentative anal analogy that I presented at the at the start throughout but uh, Part of what I think some of this comes down to is, is the question of conspicuous consumption. We can go back to Richard Bradley's uh, 1982 paper on the destruction of wealth, where he talks about the breakage of, of coppers in Northwest, um, Northwest America. And its destruction seems to be a way of, of controlling and expressing your power. The fact that you have so much of this stuff or you are secure enough in your power to destroy objects such as a shield that is rare within your community or gold which is highly unattainable suggests that this is being done by, by a community that is in control of this. Um, and as part of expressing this, destruction becomes part of a mnemonic event it's done in very particular places and in particular ways throughout time that people know about and know how things should be undertaken. So in the Middle Bronze Age, for instance, people had an idea that you had to manipulate gold in some way before it got put in the ground. In the Late Bronze Age, we see examples where it was very common to hack up lots and lots of weapons in big uh, public um, in presumably very public events where you set everything on fire. And then, to, but also wrapped up in this is the skill aspect. The fact that these things are not necessarily easy to destroy. They require certain amounts of knowledge um, that would have been, uh, perhaps would have been the reserve of a select few. Perhaps you would have needed a metal worker to understand the material properties of metal objects and how they should be how they should be reduced. And um, I, I think that it's, this talk has, has kind of prompted me to think about this in, a, in, a, in this very particular way. Um, and it's something I'm only just getting to grips with, but I, the, the idea of power through, the, through destructive actions is something that um, has quite a lot of potential, not just with uh, metal artifacts that I've presented today, but with other artifacts that we see signs of uh, deliberately commissioning throughout uh, prehistory. And on that note, I just want to say thank you again to the session organisers, thank you to you all for listening, um, and thanks to various colleagues who I've pestered about this. <laughs>